This morning in worship, we began by looking at these one-hit wonders. And this is a re-recording because an SD card broke, but uh, one-hit wonders. We looked at, uh, we saw who could rem remember the one-hit wonders of their youth. If they, if, uh, who sang Lollipop, for example. It was Ronald and Ruby. Or uh, flipping through, who sang um, Whip It, which would be Devo from the 1980s or uh, Turning Japanese, which would be The Vapors, or Tainted Love, a group called Soft Cell. And we, for the most part, forget the artists that sang these one-hit wonders, but we remember uh, the song because that song captured a moment, a set of lyrics, and just something about them really caught on. And there are books in the Bible that are like that. There are these one-hit wonders of books. In contrast, like Genesis, that covers the calling of Abraham and his entire family, this big, long book, 50-odd chapters, or uh, Jeremiah, this prophet who did not want to be called and did not want to work with a king who didn't want to listen to, this king who didn't want to listen to, to him. It's this long uh, story uh, of the impending invasion. Jeremiah is this vast book, 30-odd chapters. And then we have the books of the Bible that are like the one-hit wonders. Books that are just short, concise. You hear from this author, you hear from the, this one person hears a word from God once, it's shared, and, and then we never hear that name again. And we get books like Malachi, or Nahum, or what we're looking at today, Zephaniah. Zephaniah, which sounds like a joke. Is that book really in the, in the Bible, Pastor? Yes, yes it is, and it's okay that if you have to look up where it's at. But they're one-hit wonders. They speak to a specific time, and then they, they go away. This is part of, uh, to look at the one-hit wonders, the minor prophets, as they are called, is to take seriously what Paul writes. In, it's in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all of Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And he said all, and so that does mean all. Though the all that he's talking about would have been what we now call the Old Testament, since the New Testament wasn't done, since Paul was part of writing it and wasn't done writing it yet. But it's still, the point stands that it's all of the Bible, so they're all worth reading. And so today we're going to look at Zephaniah. Now Zephaniah, we don't know a lot about Zephaniah, we know his name, and we know when he was born, and that's enough to give us something. Zephaniah was born during the time of King Manasseh, and King Manasseh uh, followed King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good, upright king, led the people in worship, uh, upright with his neighbors, followed God, good guy. And his son, Manasseh, it's like he looked at his dad and, and, and got stuck as a 12, 13-year-old rebelling, and, and I'm not going to be anything like my dad, and just got stuck like that. And so Manasseh was a horrible king. He, he led the people uh, away from God and embraced worship of, of other pagan gods, and he uh, would just sacrifice his own children to the worship of these other gods, and he led the people in the worship of Baal, which was destructive to family and community. Uh, one of the ways it was destructive, you'd have these, these poles uh, that you could gather around, Asherah poles, and they, they tend to be the poles that you'd have find on, like, they'd be on mountains, on hilltops. And they'd be like the red light of the red light district. If you went there, uh, Baal was a fertility goddess. And so the thought was, if you went and, uh, and, and you did, uh, you, you uh, had sex with these women, that then if for the fertility of that would then impact the fertility of your fields. And, and this was destructive to family structure and community cohesion. And uh, yeah, but that was part of that worship of that false God. And so uh, Manasseh is sort of leading the people and the nation in a horrible direction. And, and then he dies. And Zephaniah, who had been born during Manasseh's reign, steps forward, and he, he sort of embodies his own name. The, the name Zephaniah means God has hidden, or God hides. And so, for this one moment, he comes out of hiding, and, and he speaks into this moment between Manasseh, and then when Josiah becomes king. And Josiah is a, a young man, teenager. Like, 
You have a hard time trusting teenagers with keys to the car. Imagine trusting a teenager with the keys to the nation. You don't know what's going to happen. And so uh, Josiah is taking over the keys to the nation. And we don't know how that's going to go. And into this moment of transition, when we don't know whether Josiah is going to, which, which of Josiah's family members is he going to take after, uh, Zephaniah steps into this moment and speaks this word from God that we now call the book of Zephaniah. And so we start, um, and, and I'll tell you the punchline, that Josiah, Josiah does end up being a, a good king, but this is part of what leads to that. So Zephaniah starts, Zephaniah is, is a three-chapter book, we're going to look at most of it right now, and he starts by saying, on behalf of God, I'm going to make a clean sweep of the earth, a thorough house cleansing is God's decree, men and women, every, anything and everything that causes sin has to go, especially people. I'll start with Judah and everyone who lives in Jerusalem, I'll sweep the place clean of every trace of this sex and religion, Baal shrine and their priests. I'll get rid of people who sneak up to their rooftops at night to worship the star gods. Those who continue to worship God but cover their bases by worshiping other gods. Not to mention those who have dumped God altogether, no longer giving a thought or a prayer. On the holy day, God's judgment day, I will punish the leaders, the royal sons who dress up like foreign priests and priestesses, who introduce pagan prayers and practices. And woe unto you shopkeepers, money making has had its day. I'll search through every closet and alley in Jerusalem and punish those who are sitting out fat and lazy, amusing themselves, saying God doesn't do anything good or bad, so neither will we. We won't do anything. But just wait, they'll lose everything. They'll build a house and never move in. They'll plant vineyards and never taste the wine. This sweeping indictment of uh, culture is shocking in its breadth. And uh, it ends with this, this phrase that is truly uh, uh, horrifying. It talks about uh, they'll build a house and never move in and plant vineyards and never uh, drink the fruit of that, that work. And throughout the Old Testament especially, whenever the message is that God will provide, it's that you will build and live in those houses, you will plant those crops, and you will eat what you plant. Like when going into the Promised Land, God will be with you and you will work and you will be able to eat of the fruit of your labor. Right? And so to say that you're going to work and you're going to build a house but not live in it, you're going to plant a crop but not eat it, that's like agricultural hell. There is nothing worse you can wish, wish upon or, or predict for uh, an agricultural society. You're going to work, but you're not going to get the crop. Right? That's how bad it's going to be. The scope of this is just breathtaking. That's not where Zephaniah stops, thankfully. The next chapter switches gears, and Zephaniah says, So get yourselves together and shape up. You are a nation without a clue about what it wants. So before you're blown away, before God's judgment anger sweeps down on you, seek God, all of you quietly disciplined people. Seek God's right ways. Seek a quiet and disciplined life. Perhaps you'll be hidden on the day of God's anger. This is a call to worship. Seek God. Get together. Gather in God's name. This is worship. To confess and repent and perhaps it'll work out. No certainty, because certainty when it comes to asking God is uh, would be called arrogance, but humility. Perhaps. And we know that perhaps came to pass because we have this book. If we didn't have this book, uh, if it hadn't come to pass, then we wouldn't have this book because you don't keep, you wouldn't, it wouldn't have been kept, if that makes sense. So sort of a survivor's bias, you might say. But the, the, what we're seeing here is that the response to when things go off the rails is to begin with worship. All right, the word begin with worship. And in case anyone isn't sure what the consequence will be for those who just flat ignore this, Zephaniah goes on to lay out for individual nations and what will happen and talks about how for uh, Moab and Amnon, they will end up like Sodom and Gomorrah, a field of rocks, a sterile salt flat, a moonscape 
for a, and he goes through a couple other kingdoms like this. So that we see the consequences for becoming a people that turn away from God uh, are real. Now what happens in other nations has begun in Israel after Manasseh's uh, disastrous rule. And so what's going to happen is that's going to change. Now we're getting into chapter 3. And, and so uh, Zephaniah declares on behalf of God that Jerusalem, he calls Jerusalem the, the sewer city, which to call a city a, a sewer is a... Uh, Ooh, right? a, the sewer city, Jerusalem, that won't take advice, won't accept correction, won't trust God. Her very own leaders are rapacious lions. Her judges are rapacious timber wolves. Her prophets are out for what they can get. You can't trust them. Her priests desecrate the sanctuary and use God's law as a weapon to maim and kill souls. Yet God remains in her midst, untouched by evil, stays at it, meeting out justice. But, and God will show, this is the, the turn to the last chunk of, the, of, of this book, but God will get God's goal, and, and we read, in the end, I will turn things around for the people, I will give them a language undistorted and unpolluted, words to worship, words to address God and worship, and united to serve me with their shoulders to the wheel. All my scattered people will come home with offerings for worship. I'll have gotten rid of your arrogant leaders and so, such that they do not piously strut on my holy hill. I'll leave a core of people among you who are poor in spirit. What's left of Israel that's really Israel, they'll make their home in God. And so then we wrap up with this end result of hope that the, the people who follow and, and gather to worship, what uh, we hear from them to this word to them is to sing, to rejoice, to be happy and celebrate, for God has reversed this judgment against you and sent your enemies chasing their tails. The accumulated sorrows of your exile will dissipate. I, your God, will get rid of them. You've carried these burdens long enough. I'll heal the maimed. I'll bring home the homeless. In the countries where you are hated, you will be venerated. You'll be famous and honored all over the world. You'll see it with your own eyes. The painful, and partings, tur painful partings turned into family reunions. So King Josiah, that's the end of the book, right? So jo Josiah becomes the king who, who will lead people towards this. Having heard Zephaniah, uh, having been raised rightly himself, which is a different story, uh, that's what happens. And so we are left with this one-hit wonder, and we are left with this question of how do we hear it today? Because it fits a particular time and place, it, it, it can apply in some ways, but not in others. In the same way that if, I re, if we re-released, um, let's see, uh, Cool or Little Girl by Syndicate of Sound, back in 1966, that was as happening as it got. But if I release that today, I don't think that would have quite the same pull. Or, or Monster Mash, or uh, City of New, or New Orleans, or Playground in My Mind, all, Kung Fu Fighting. Like, if we released these one-hit wonders from years ago today, and they went on the radio for the first time, I, I don't think they'd have quite the same impact today as they did then. That doesn't make them bad music, it just means that it, they'd be heard differently. It's the same thing with this. It's the Word of God for us, the people of God. We have to figure out how it's the Word of God for us, the people of God, in this moment, in this, this time. And so Zephaniah is meant to challenge, is meant to shock, right? To, to Zephaniah begins by shocking people and making them question what has come before. And that is part of what the prophets do. Any problem that leads to a prophet showing up is a problem that took a generation or two to cause. And so for a prophet to show up and to get people to question how their parents did things, now how they do things, that, that's a challenge. And so there is that, that th aspect of this to break our ears so that we can hear challenges to how we live. What Zephaniah is pointing at may or may not be our challenge today. Merchants who put prophets before all else, leaders in the church that are not trustworthy, leaders of, of, of the people who are out for what they can get. The response to all these problems in Zephaniah's day and in today continues to be the same. 
It's right there in the second chapter. Seek God, all you people. Gather to worship all who want to live by God's justice. Seek God's right way. Seek a quiet and disciplined life, and perhaps you'll be hidden on the day of God's anger. Right, whether the problems of the day are Zephaniah's or, or ours today, the, the first response is to seek to worship, seek God. And I think we see this in what happens shortly after Zephaniah. <clears throat> As I told you, Josiah ends up being a good king, and, and here's how it happens. Josiah wants to go back to how his great-grandfather, Hezekiah, had run things. And so he starts getting the temple cleaned up. This temple is it's the one temple in Jerusalem where all the people gather. And, and as he sends people to get it cleaned up, they come to him and they bring a scroll. And it is the Bible, or what we would, we would now call uh, the Torah, the five books of Moses. But like, it's the Bible as far as it was written at that point. And so they, he looks at it, and he's never seen it before. Like, imagine being in the capital the capital of, of, of the nation, and there only being one church, and in that one church is one copy of the Bible, and that one copy of the Bible is lost for a generation. Like, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Josiah has never read the Bible before, and so he reads it, and he is stricken by this, and so what he does is he calls all the people together, and, and he says, let us worship. Let us commit to this way of worship, right? To, to worship together as a people. And this is what is the beginning of everything Josiah does. It all starts with worship. Can't grapple with anything else. Can't seek anything else. Can't trust that God will do anything. Start with worship first. I believe that that is still true today. No matter what life has brought uh, us to, or no matter what we struggle with today, the way that we begin to respond in, in either what we're going to do or what we're going to ask God to do, I, all of that is to practice worship together and believe that that is how we seek a quiet and disciplined life to be hidden in the day of God's anger. Amen.